thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to our uh, evening, which for the first time in quite a while is actually not going to be particularly surgically based. We've limited the surgical talks, which will be good. Uh, that's probably why the turnout's better. Um, <laughs> So today's program is Trauma in the Elderly. We've got some great talks. We're going to start off giving you a bit of background information about our volume of, uh, of trauma here in terms of how that relates to the elderly. Um, we're reaching capacity a bit with our trauma unit at the moment in terms of inpatient numbers. So thinking of novel ways, better ways to manage our patients, uh, particularly from the elderly point of view, would be very beneficial in trying to plan for the future. Uh, our first talk is from uh, Rose Shakirian. She's going to give us some background on uh, the burden of care for patients. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to try not to spill the opportunity here. Disaster. Um, thank you, Ben, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance, not just to those of you who are here at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, but to all of our guests watching us online. I hope you find the session informative and useful. As a trauma surgeon at the Royal Melbourne Hospital today, I'm going to give you an overview of trauma in the elderly patient population, and hope, hopefully through this talk, I'm able to highlight some of the issues that we face or challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis in managing this particular age group. I'm hoping that this talk will then set the scene for the remaining presentations that are to be given by our wonderful speakers this evening. So we all know that the size of the world's population is increasing, but we need to be aware that it's also aging. According to the World Health Organization, the number of people aged 60 years and over is going to increase from 900 million to 2 billion by 2050. Now, this will have a significant impact on our healthcare resources, not just for primary care, but long-term care as well. The World Health Organization is strongly advising health services around the world to firstly recognize the need and secondly to develop resources that are appropriate or workforce that is appropriately resourced and trained to recognize the needs of the elderly. They talk about older person centered care that needs to be integrated. With respect to Australia, our population is also aging. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the proportion of people aged 65 years and over is also going to nearly double. For us, this has been attributed to the sustained low fertility rates, but also the increased life expectancy of our population because of improved lifestyle factors and a wonderful healthcare system. Now, some of you may have heard of the term silver tsunami. Essentially, it's, it's, it's being used increasingly in the literature to describe the shift in the, demo, uh, in, uh, the demographic shift in the population. Now, whichever natural disaster phenomenon you wish to use, hurricane, cyclone, uh, earthquake, to describe this aging population, we all need to recognize that we will be having an increasing number of older people around who will hopefully be more active and will be uh, living their lives to the fullest. But at the same time, through their sheer presence for uh, much longer times, they're going to be involved in more trauma. So they will be having car accidents. That's actually a real accident. This guy uh, rolled his car in California and his wife requested for her phone so she could take a selfie while she's being rescued. But they will be falling off their bikes. Unfortunately, they will be run over by, by, by cars, making trauma no longer the disease that's been previously perceived as solely or predominantly for the younger adults. Now, the other things that, that the older people tend to do, they have a fascination with heights. So they're going up ladders to, to pick fruit. They, they, they love to prune their trees and their plants. And for some reason, when it's wet, slippery, rainy and cold, they want to get up on ladders. And of course, they fall. Unfortunately, you know, from the trauma surgeon's per per perspective, it's, it's not the juicy fall from height falls with lots of injuries. They fall from stairs. They fall from standing height. They fall from standing height. Now, just looking at some data from the Victorian uh, Trauma Registry, as you can see here, the largest increase in the rate of hospitalization for major trauma consistently, uh, when you look at the last five years, it has been in the oldest age group, so age greater than 84, whereas for the remaining age groups, it has remained steady. 
When we look at the most common mechanism of injury for hospitalization for major trauma, it is falls, which is low falls in those who are aged greater than 64. And it's not surprising then to see that the most common in hospital, um, the, the, sorry, the most common cause for in hospital deaths in major trauma then is for low falls. So to summarize that data, old people fall from standing height, they sustain injuries, they get admitted, and unfortunately, many don't survive. Now, what's happening at the Royal Melbourne Hospital? Our trauma numbers over the years are continuing to increase. In 2018, we had 4,672 total trauma admissions to the hospital. Of this 1,228, in, uh, in red, you can see is for elderly patients aged greater than 64. And of that, 333 qualified as a major trauma. So a third of our trauma admissions are older patients. A third of our major trauma are older patients. The most common mechanism of injury is falls in the older groups, groups as you can see, 59% in those aged greater than 64, followed by motor vehicle crashes and then pedestrians. As opposed to the younger patients who are involved in motor vehicle crashes and then falls, in the younger population, the falls are higher falls as opposed to those who are older. When we look at where these patients are being managed, the majority of the patients are being admitted under the trauma unit. The trauma unit is a, a consultant-led surgical service. But you can also see there that we have orthopedics and neurosurgery who also admit patients, as well as emergency and short-stay unit and the medical units. For both the younger adults, but 75% of the elderly trauma are being managed by a surgical team. So, um, here we have percentage of a proportion of patients who are being admitted to ICU. All of this data is from major trauma. So about a third of the elderly major trauma are being admitted to the intensive care unit. Whilst having a lower injury severity score, they have a much higher death rate when they're admitted to ICU. When we look at our overall trauma deaths by age, the older patients have a much higher rate per year despite a lower injury severity score. We've started to collect data for anticoagulation therapy in our major trauma patients. The blue box is summarizing the data for all of our trauma, uh, the major trauma. So 44% of the older patients are on some form of anticoagulation therapy. When we look at falls specifically, 48% are anticoagulated, and of those, 39% are again in patients who are having low falls. With length of stay in hospital, the mo I think the most um, the obvious significance is in the minor injured patients. So all the patients which don't qualify as a major trauma compared to the younger ones end up being in hospital much longer, so on average three days compared to 0.7 days in those who sustain major trauma. And when we look at our discharge destinations, so if you just look at the orange bar, which is summarizing the results for the older major trauma patients, 62% are discharged to some form of rehab, and unfortunately, they have twice as much as a death rate, so 14 versus 7% in the younger patients. So to summarize this data, the older patients have a higher mortality, longer ICU stays, longer hospital stays, and are more commonly discharged to nursing home. This is no doubt related to their age-related physiological changes, which are then exas exacerbated by their injuries and also the treatment of their injuries, and they have higher rates of pre-existing comorbidities and complications. So at Royal Melbourne Hospital, we're very good um, in dealing with patients who are injured. We, we resuscitate them well. We are very good at identifying their injuries and putting them back together. This is a real life case that I was involved with two years ago. A 75 year old man who was cleaning his gutters um, on a rainy day. He fell off the ladder, presented as a trauma call, hypo, uh, hypotensive, hypoxic. He's, he had a high injury severity score. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to let you know that he had multiple interventions. So a 75-year-old had two angioembolizations, three laparotomies, was in ICU for 13 days, 22 days in hospital. He was discharged to rehab. I reviewed him personally in clinic, at home at six months, independent, walking five kilometers a day. I would like to say, or I wish all of my elderly patients were like this, but 
that's supposed to be me, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I've deliberately left my hair out because Ben says it's my only sort of, it's a defining feature, despite how harsh it is, so, but just bear with me. So the question is, what about all the other patients that don't come with the bells and whistles like the patient that I described? When we look at our data, almost 900 of our admissions are elderly trauma that don't meet the major trauma criteria, right? One of the deficiencies of our, the deficiencies of our databases, the registries, is that we're so focused on major trauma. All of our uh, outcomes and assessments are for major trauma patients. What about the minor trauma? This is a snapshot of the trauma in patients at the hospital. I've blocked out the patient identifying information. Uh, this is half the page because I couldn't fit the rest. But just on this page, a quarter of the patients are aged, the ones that I've marked, over 64 years who've sustained falls. Now, this is what happens on my ward round. I have the diligent registrar who says to me, Mr. XY is 86 years old, who's presented from a low-level care nursing home, who's fallen from standing heights. He's got a small subarachnoid hemorrhage, some rib fractures on the right side, and possibly an old crush fracture of his L1. And then we get it to his past history. So AF, congestive cardiac failure, TIAs, type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, I can't even say them as the surgeon, I'm having a panic, a panic attack right now, <laughs> but chronic renal failure, mild um, dementia, Parkinson's, and a recent decline in function. And then we go through the meds, and I've got this bubble expanding because I'm truly getting palpitations now because the patient's anticoagulated, they've got diabetic meds, they've got Parkinson's meds, and then... <laughs> Then comes the, you know, the, the bit that really is causing anxiety because I hear this patient's either confused or delirious. As surgeons, we are terrible in recognizing delirium, let alone managing it. Now, when you put that in the trauma scene where you've, you've got someone who has previous cognitive impairment and the sustained head trauma, what are you supposed to do with them? I mean, what, what does confusion or delirium mean for these patients, right? So then we move on to then having to organize their goals of care, getting the other disciplines involved to get definitive management plans, the allied health review, and uh, making decisions about discharge planning. And all along, I'm thinking, as a surgeon, there's nothing for me to do for this patient, right? So that's going through my mind. And so the list continues, and I hear NOACs and DOACs. I mean, where did DOACs come from? I just got my head around NOACs. And so then it's like Chad Vascor and the registrars are really pleased with themselves because they see the look of horror on my face. And I get the sinking feeling, and I start asking for help because I need the ortho, uh, ortho uh, Jerry's register try to come and help, not just me, but the poor patients as well. So thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Rose. I actually forgot to introduce you. Uh, I knew everyone would know you, and they know you now. So Rose is one of our trauma surgeons here. I was going to try to keep the questions actually till the end until we've got a panel at the front here. So we're going to run through the presentations. So save your questions up to the end. Our next uh, presenter is Annalise Coco, who's our Trauma and Emergency General Surgical Fellow at the moment. Annalise comes from Sydney, from uh, Westmead, and uh, leaves us this year, uh, next year to head off to uh, Houston in Texas to continue her trauma training. Annalise. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. I have a warning. I enjoy interactive presentations. So I will have a few questions for the audience, and I'll need a show of hands. And this is up and this is down, because I'm a surgeon and I don't understand middle grounds. So if we can all, uh, if we can all play along, that would be really good. So what I'm talking about is two different women with the same mechanism of injury. OK, so as we've heard from Rose, this is our patient in the trauma service at Royal Melbourne Hospital, someone who's fallen from standing height. I should say that both of the cases, both the patients I'm going to present today, were very happy to have their clinical photographs used, and I think they tell a bit of a story. So I have put it in the MIST format, which you can all read, but she had a fall. She was, um, she's from a low-level care nursing home. She was visiting her son on some day leave, kind of had a bit of a mechanical fall, a bit of a slide down the wall. <laughs> Felt okay at the time, so he took her back to the nursing home. And then later on in the evening, it became quite clear that she actually did have something going on. And so the nursing home then called the ambulance. And this is what you can see here. So the first question I have is, what is her frailty score? So I don't know how well it's projecting. Basically, you've got one to nine. Nine is your dying 
Okay. One is you are fitter than other people your age. Now, I don't know how many people in the audience would give themselves a one. So for that reason, I'm going to break it up into three. So people who think based on that photo alone, is she a one to three? Is she a four to six? Or is she a seven to nine? So I want hands and I want them up. Okay. Who thinks that L, the lovely lady we saw, would be a between a one and a three? So three is managing well and one is very fit. Any hands? Oh, you're just so cynical. <laughs> okay, four to six. So four is vulnerable and six is moderately frail. Four to six. Okay. Seven to nine. I'm actually impressed. She's a six. Well done. Okay, very good. So she had a frailty score at admission, which is when we do it, of six. So, a bit more. We're having a rose moment, right? So she's got vascular dementia. She has osteoarthritis. She's had reflux. She's already had a fractured neck of femur and managed to get to a low level care nursing home. So maybe that actually says a bit about it too. Um, that was nine years ago. She's got depression, she's on an SSRI. I started writing out her medication list and I just stopped. Um, but I think it's more important actually is her social history, right? So she's in a low level care nursing home. She can't hear very well and she's a bit doddery on her feet and she has smoked her entire 86 year old life, pretty much, in utero. So, this is all she has, right? Reassurance time, okay? She has a single system injury, right? It's just rib fractures. There are only four. I've got the recons there because I like them, because I use them, but that's another story. Um, so that, that's her injury. That's it. I have another question. Four rib fractures, smoker, 86 years old. Does anyone in the audience just want to have a guess, ballpark figure, what's her inpatient mortality risk? Been shouted out. No one's shy here. We're all we're all working at Royal Melbourne or come to visit us. So, oh, the cynicism. I like it. Anyone else? Oh, I feel like we're in a reverse auction. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, unfortunately, we don't have a really accurate way of working this out. But what Bolger et al. did is they only looked at age and number of fractures. Okay. So that's what you can see here. They didn't bring into it frailty or smoking status. And even with that, as you can see, every additional rib fracture you have, if you are over 64, increases your inpatient mortality risk, your 30-day mortality by 19%. So based on that, so she had four ribs, if you draw it across, like 20%-ish, 20% or so, okay? I think it's gonna be higher, I'm with you, because she's frail and she smokes. But raw numbers, that's one in five of these patients, just like Elle, who are not going to go home. Actually, it's even more who won't go home. It's people who won't leave alive. Pneumonia, everyone's favourite. So she, based on the ribs, not based on the smoking, has an inpatient risk of getting pneumonia of 30%. And once again, what they showed in this paper was every additional rib increases your risk of pneumonia by nearly 30%. So if you initially had a 10% risk, you get another rib, 13 so, she got admitted under the trauma team to the Jerry's ward. She wasn't seen by the trauma team in ED. When the team reviewed her, they chatted her up some, for some analgesia, some DVT prophylaxis. I'll talk a bit about that shortly. Uh, this is all depressingly predictable. Um, so she had oral analgesia, not all that much regular, quite a bit of PRN. On the second day, she had a met call for a decreased GCS because you might remember she had quite a few comorbidities and she was on a combination of her usual SSRI with um, Targen. Uh, she also had, I think, a butte patch and she had some PRN morphine. And so all of that combined, we looked into other causes, but we worked out that actually would probably narcotize the patient. And in that setting, the decreased GCS, losing the respiratory drive, pneumonia developed the next day. Once all this has happened, hypoxia is bad for brain function, as we all know, and so it makes it really hard for people to engage with physio and OT when they can't think straight because they've got pneumonia with their horrible rib fractures for which they're receiving analgesia. So she couldn't really engage very well. She ended up getting transferred to the medical team on day seven, and on day 16, she went back to her nursing home. Frailty score of six. I'd like to introduce you to someone else very soon. Before that, this is a busy slide, but basically what this is saying is that everything is in a big circle of badness for these patients. So they come in with pain. 
We need to treat that in an appropriate fashion because if we don't, they don't breathe. People who don't breathe get pneumonia. They cough, they get confused, and they're not engaging with what they need to be doing. They get drowsy, they're not going to get fed, then you've got malnutrition on the top, then the analgesia plus the lack of normal diet plus the not mobilising means that the bowels go off, which means that it all just keeps going. And it's really important to intervene so that this doesn't become a vicious cycle and it stops somewhere. But this is G. She's 89. She also fell from standing height um, onto her right side and was called, the ambulance was called again. Her vital signs on scene were normal. Again, she's given some analgesia and some oxygen. So we're going to play the game again. Okay, does everyone remember what she looks like? Yeah? All right, so I'd like some hands. One to three. Oh, look at all the positive people. It's changed, okay? Four to six. Seven to nine. Oh, I'd hope not. She's a two, so well done. See, and what's really interesting, right, in an N equals two environment, is that the majority of people are able to pick from a single clinical photograph taken on day one of admission a ballpark of how frail someone is. So it's actually not that difficult. You just need to look at people. Anyway, uh, you can see she has comorbidities too. Her type 2 diabetes is managed uh, just with oral and all. Um, sorry, she's not even oral. She's just diet controlled. So I think from memory, the chronic renal failure is hypertensive nephropathy. She lives alone, she's fiercely independent, council gives her some help once a fortnight and she does her own cooking, thank you very much, and she likes the food that she cooks. She has six rib fractures. Six. I don't know if anyone can remember the slides from before about the mortality risk for that, so I put it again somewhere. But we'll check. Six rib fractures, non-smoker. Non-smoker, and she's 89, so she's even older. So does anyone want to give her a ballpark? Mortality, six ribs, 89. 50. 50. Oh, wow. Anyone else? Getting closer, yeah. So she's up. So she's like 25 or so. And again, we remember increase all comers 19% if you're an elderly patient. Every single rib that you add on, increase mortality 19%. And pneumonia, so her pneumonia risk was sitting up nearly 40%. Okay, so that's huge. That's two in every five, four in every ten. It's a lot of this room if we were over 65. So she was seen by the trauma team in ED. She had PCA started. She had oral analgesia along with it, uh, adjusted, renally adjusted. She also had DVT prophylaxis, and a referral was made when she was admitted for chest physio. She was getting there, still a bit sore, didn't have indications for rib fixation. Um, but she wasn't as confident as she used to be, and so on day five, she went across for some rehab, and she went home, back to her home, on day 14. So these are the two. Frailty two on, the, on everyone's right, frailty six on the left. So I think this highlights to me a number of issues. One, the importance of frailty, which I feel certain we're going to hear a lot about tonight. Two, low falls are bad. Okay, we kind of... Same as ribs, I think. There's a kind of, yep, it's just a low fall. It's not a big mechanism. It's not a big deal. Uh, but it kills more, thing, more patients that we have here than anything else does. Third is analgesia in elderly patients and how difficult or nuanced that can be and the importance of multimodal analgesia and thinking about comorbidities and thinking about the best method of delivery for your individual patient. And I actually think the other thing that's really important is bundles of care. So that idea that if you can have a tiny little incremental gain from a few different things and you put them together and potentially that makes a difference to what we're doing. So I have some take home messages because it's me and that's that um, biological age does not correlate to physiologic age. I would say that we surgeons sometimes say once you operate on someone they do declare themselves as actually being 90 but uh, up until that point when they're coming in with their rib fractures it's really different that the, frail, the patient who's weren't managing at home doing her own cooking versus the one who's in a low level care nursing home trouble getting around already fractured a hip before um, and the other thing I'd really like to hammer home is that there was traditionally quite a bit of nihilism I think around rib fractures because you felt like you couldn't do anything and you felt like it didn't matter anyway because they'd all get better. And I think that the, the studies that we have, the information we have, 
reminds us that it's actually a big risk of mortality for those patients and significant morbidity. And so we need to take them seriously and recognise that fractured ribs in old patients who are then smokers and everything else makes them a high risk group. And that means that they deserve early intervention. So anyway, they're quite cute, that old coffee. Any questions are at the end, I think, aren't they? So that's it. Not all 80-year-olds are the same. You can make it better. And sometimes they can even get home, just like Rose's patient. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Annalise. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Kate Gregorovic who is a, a geriatrician at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, uh, um, working both in acute general medicine and also in aged care. Recently completed a PhD on the intersection between frailty and protective psychosocial factors called health assets. And uh, Kate's gonna speak to us about uh, the, the topic of frailty. So, oops, hang on. So today we're going to be talking about frailty and I think anyone working in clinical medicine with adults would realise that frailty is one of the most important concepts we have at the moment and something that we all need to understand and get better at identifying to do the best for our patients. So to start with, what is frailty? So the commonly accepted definition is frailty is a frail individual is someone who's got a loss of homeostatic reserve, meaning that they are vulnerable to a significant decline in function from a seemingly minor insult. And so the slide I've got there has the minor illness as a urinary tract infection. And very often I see this bandied about as the reason, the underlying diagnosis, why someone might have a delirium, why they might have come in with a fall, why they might have come in with a functional decline. But what we need to consider as well is that for most people, a urinary tract infection is not enough to do that. Most people get some symptoms, feel a bit off, have some antibiotics, get better. If someone comes in and they've had this seemingly minor insult and this major decline that's perhaps led them needing hospital care, this tells us a bit about what is going on with their underlying physiology. So when we talk about measuring frailty, the clinical measurement of frailty, what we are really trying to get is an idea of their biological ageing. And as we heard in the previous talk, two people who are 80 are often physiologically quite different. And so biological ageing is that accumulation of changes that happens through age. So it includes things like DNA damage. So with every cellular replication, we get DNA errors. This accumulates over time. Telomeres shorten, the caps on the end of cells, which can then lead to further DNA instability. Mitochondrial function can decline. There's also some epigenetic changes. So the way that our genes are expressed can change with age. And all of these things accumulate, leading to an accumulation of errors at the DNA level, at the cellular level, which then when you've got more damage at the cellular level, you've got less tissue reserve, less organ reserve, translating into what we see with physical frailty. And the other part of this as well, which I'll allude to, is changes in immune activation. So the reason that part of this, one of the theories that people become frail is related to immunosenescence. And this again, I think, comes back to when we see people with older adults with trauma who are frail with getting infections. It's not just physical factors, it's also that we know that frail older adults don't have the same level of immune function. And this is seen simply as people don't respond as well to vaccines. So when a vaccine titer is measured for someone who's frail, it doesn't go up in the same way. Um, but at the same time, older adults who are frail also have higher levels of baseline inflammation. And it's thought that this accumulated tissue damage, as well as changes within the immune system itself, leads to increased activation of the innate immune system. And that these higher levels of baseline inflammation, or what, what we can, another, what we can also call allostatic load, or basically the number of things wrong, means that other compensatory systems in the body are always just that little bit more active. So someone who is frail is constantly, is working at a higher physiological level just to do the normal day-to-day -day things we take for granted, like paying attention, which is lost in delirium, maintaining posture upright against gravity, which is not falling. So moving on from this is where we look at it in the clinical setting. And getting a little bit controversial here, um, 
I don't know that we can always identify frailty just by how we look at somebody. And there's been one study in cardiologists looking at end of the bed, and their assessment end of the bed didn't correlate with a measurement of frailty. But when we talk about clinical measurement of frailty, there are many, many different tools that are being used. And so this very busy slide here, which I don't think anyone would be able to read, this is a systematic review of frailty tools that have been used in the trauma setting. They looked at 32 different tools and found that only four of them actually were feasible and objective. And so we have this knowledge that people are different physiologically, have different levels of reserve in older age. We've got so more frailty tools than I think anyone could ever get their head around, but they're not all measuring the same thing. So in a systematic review done by Maya Cubitt here, she looked at frailty measures and in trauma population, one frailty tool identified 13% of people as frail, another identified 91% of people as frail. Now this wasn't the same population, but there is one study that was done in the Australian setting which looked at a population group and retrospectively applied four different frailty tools. One of them identified around 2% of the population as frail, another one was over 60%. And so what this means is when we talk about a frailty measurement tool, we're not, they're not all measuring the same thing. So it's not enough just to say, I've got X tool. It's got to be actually looked at, is it valid associated with outcomes? So there's a big push at the moment to look at frailty measurement. But when we do, we need to look at whether it has predictive validity. So a frailty, the whole thing is someone who's frail should be vulnerable to mortality, should be vulnerable to a significant functional decline. And if the tool we're using doesn't predict that, it's not useful. It needs to have inter-rater reliability. One thing which I think is quite underrated is the feasibility. And when someone comes into hospital, and this isn't just when they've had trauma, they might not be able to tell you much about themselves. There might be a lot of extra information that needs to be gathered. Clinicians are very, very busy. Everyone, the nursing admission itself has got I don't even know how many items, but it's pages of items. And it's got to be careful about applying extra work to people without it actually being meaningful. And as I said, the clinical utility. So it's got to be something that it's not enough just to implement frailty measurement. We've got to look at how it actually guides our decision making and how useful it is. And so moving on just with final thought. So I think we'd all agree that mobility scooters should be speed limited to walking speed. <laughs> But the other thought that I want to leave you with as well is when we see someone who's 80, their health status is the result of a lifetime of accumulated factors. It's the result of biological factors, genetics, the genetics that important, social factors, events that have happened in their life. This is why everyone ages at different rates. This is why everyone will be different at that certain older age level. And what we know is when we put a valid frailty measure in older populations, age itself is not predictive of adverse outcomes. Frailty is. And we talk a lot about personalised medicine. It's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. And this is something that we do need to start getting better at and start looking at. And it's taking that history from people. So looking at their, um, you know, looking at their physical function, looking at not just that trying to get in some sort of measure where possible of what their cognitive function is like. And there's some tools we can use to screen with family, get some informant, and there are some tools that have been quick tools that would be great to start using in the acute setting as well. Because all of these things are going to affect how well someone's able to cope with it. And with this as well, when someone comes in and they're under a trauma unit from a fall from standing height, this can be the first presentation of frailty because most people that fall from standing height are going to be okay. So if they're coming in with injuries all over their body, it tells you a lot about what's going on in the background. And the other part of this is that personalised medicine needs to come with bundles of care and systems. And we've got the orthogeriatrics model has actually been around since, there was a report back in 1980 on it. And I think we've got some really great lessons from that. And so partly is that standardisation of care, um, but it's also about teamwork, and I do not have the skills of our amazing trauma surgeons, um, but I'd like to think that I can help with identifying and managing delirium, with looking at the medical issues. 
And we all want the same things for our patients. We all want to provide the best possible care and get the best possible outcomes for them. And I think in this model, hopefully, we can work towards working together to bring those skills in to get those outcomes for our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. That was great. Uh, Professor Quang Lim is our next speaker. Uh, he's currently the Clinical Director of Medicine and Aged Care at Royal Melbourne Hospital with research interests involving the health service interventions in the care of the older patients with chronic diseases, including studies in the perioperative cardiac injury and emergency orthopaedic patients, chronic heart failure and delirium. And uh, you're going to tell us now about falling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so a lot of <laughs> slides are going to kind of correlate with previous speakers, but um, I guess some of you might have seen this study by Beck, which looked at an audit of uh, Victorian trauma patients over a kind of 10-year period. And no surprises, low falls are the kind of primary presentation, if you like. Um, high falls up to 10%. So about three quarters of patients who present with trauma are uh, falls. So hence the relevance of this talk. Um, and as patients get older, the number of patients with major trauma have more than doubled in the last 10 years. And what was striking to me was the mortality of these patients. So if you kind of look at it, after injury, 12 months after injury, 42 patients had died. That's really a massive um, uh, mortality effect. And half of those that survived were not living independently. So we've got a major problem in terms of um, the outcome of these patients. So the question is, can we do anything about it? This kind of reflects the, uh, thanks to Kelly, I got these slides, um, the experience at Royal Melbourne where, you know, 60 odd percent of patients who presented to the trauma unit um, were um, presenting because of low falls. And in terms of injuries, um, uh, no surprises, kind of the, uh, I guess, external injuries, soft tissue injuries was the majority, but 20 um, percent were kind of lower extremity fractures or pelvic fractures, which have also um, uh, huge implications in terms of poor outcome. So why do patients die? Um, look, you know, we, people like me always like to slide in a little bit of research that we've done before just to prove our credentials. So this was a study we did about 10 years ago and basically found that patients who had uh, with emergency orthopedic surgery, those who had a troponin rise actually had a reasonably high mortality, um, so about 40% uh, were dead within a year. And also, interestingly enough, the higher your troponin, the more likely you were to die. Um, so to summarize that troponin was independently associated with increased mortality over a year, there was a significant relationship between the magnitude of the peak of troponin, so cardiac injury, and it was a prognostic marker for all the patients undergoing orthopedic surgery. And subsequently, this has been re replicated in a number of studies, vascular surgery, other types of general surgery. Um, but the question is, is it a cardiac problem or is it just a marker of frailty, as, um, as Kate has alluded to? And we think it's probably more a marker of frailty. We subsequently did a randomized trial um, sticking patients with troponin rises in the best cardiac care they could get, monitoring, cardiac follow-up. Uh, but given, given what um, uh, Kate mentioned about cardiologists, maybe they weren't the right call to look after frail patients. Uh, actually, a funny study is that Kate did a study where she looked at interns predicting frailty, and interns could consistently predict frailty in patients with, and that actually predicted outcomes. So it appears that both interns and surgeons are better than cardiologists at predicting <laughs> outcomes and all. Um, so can we do anything about frailty? So we do know that it's a predictor of future falls amongst um, community-dwelling older people. So this is a meta-analysis that has been performed and shows that if you're frail then in, and you live in the community, then you have a 65% greater risk of falling. And in terms of all, I deliberately didn't put up the clinical frailty scale because I knew everybody else would. But this is one of the scales that's been validated in falls. So it's um, uh, SF criteria, 
for frailty, which just looks at three kind of markers, if you like. Um, weight loss more than 5%, um, inability to do five chair stands, so that just, that's just a function of proximal muscle weakness, and whether they feel full of energy. So just these three questions, if you scored two out of three, you're at a high risk of falling. And frailty has been shown in a number of studies and meta-analysis to be a high predictor of falls. So um, frail women at a two and a half times greater risk of recurrent falls, um, disability, um, fractures, whether it's hip or non-spine fractures, and death. Uh, and, and basically, frailty is a good predictor of, uh, of uh, mortality, but you know, can you do anything about it? That's the million dollar question. Um, so if someone comes in with a fall, how do we predict if they're going to fall again? Because it's important, I guess, to target people we think are going to be most at risk. Um, so like, like everything in health, um, past performance tends to be a predictor of future performance, unlike the share market. So um, I had, a, I had a, um, a PhD student who spent three years studying heart failure, working out every single iteration and of 60,000 patients on what was a predictor of future readmissions with heart failure. And the only thing she found was previous readmissions with heart failure. So, <laughs> so same with falls. If you've fallen more than twice in, in 12 months, you, the, you get an odds ratio of three and a half. So you're three and a half times more likely to fall in the future. So a simple question, you know, have you fallen before? That's a good predictor. Obviously, there's some other risk factors. So physical disability, if you use a frame, you're, you're a lot more likely to fall. If you need assistance with your um, uh, activities of daily living. Um, certain medications also increase your risk, antidepressants, sedatives, um, antihypertensives, and that normally relates to postural hypertension. So one of the things that tends to happen in the community is that people get loaded up on lots of blood pressure medications. And we know that, we all know now that about 25 to 30 percent of people have white coat hypertension. So the reality is a lot of people are actually hypotensive, and they're still getting loaded up with blood pressure tablets. Um, sensory impairment is very important. I'll, talk, I'll touch on that later. And other kind of, I guess, vestibular Parkinson's disease kind of um, syndromes. Uh, cognitions is a big risk factor. So if you have dementia, you're more likely to fall. And that's for multitude of reasons. So one is your balance is normally impaired. But two is your perceptions of risk are significantly altered. So there was a beautiful study in Sydney where they uh, had a bunch of patients. Um, there was like a drawbridge across a, a lake or kind of river, if you like. And they asked um, uh, subjects to identify how narrow the bridge could be before they could cross safely. And patients with dementia identified bridges that were almost as narrow as a tightrope. So, their kind of perception of risk is, is really impaired. Um, <laughs> in, in, inability to dual task as well. Um, so, you know, talking and walking is a problem. Uh, so can we prevent falls? Uh, the answer is yes, we can. So I guess you, you've seen someone with trauma and a fall. The, the main thing is to prevent future fall if they survive. Uh, so, been, so this was a meta-analysis that's been refreshed and only got published last year. Basically 90 papers, so a lot of papers. And I'll give you the highlights. So this is all to do with exercise and comes up recurrently. Um, so exercise programs that improve balance reduce falls. And that is, you know, um, normally stuff you do on one leg. Because when you walk, pretty, you're pretty much spending half your time on one leg. So the most important thing is to get that balance on one leg, um, shifting and reaching, um, and also uh, being able to stand up independently without the use of your arm. So that's the proximal muscle weakness and the locking of the knee. So they're kind of the essential components. Um, at least three hours duration of exercise per week, which is really hard to achieve. Um, and also previously, it said a 50-hour program. So that's almost impossible to achieve. So, there's a few kind of, um, so unless you get kind of community interventions with lots of exercises, it's actually very hard to achieve. 
on what happens in our system. So the Victorian system is lucky because there are a lot of multidisciplinary falls clinics. And this was a study done on, um, on evaluation of all the falls clinics in Victoria and basically demonstrated that multi-component interventions work. Um, so I love the fact that the surgeons know that um, looking after patients is a team, uh, is a team sport and, and certainly as geriatricians we need everybody involved. So that involves the physios, occupational therapists, um, podiatrists, um, and they're the things that kind of contribute towards a better outcome. Uh, this was a great study. So basically glasses are, it was a very simple study. They basically took people's bifocals and multifocals off them and just gave them proper glasses and reduced falls significantly. The problem when you look through multifocals at steps is that you actually can't see uh, uneven pavements in steps. So you're kind of looking down and we're reading glasses basically. So I think it's critical to get rid of multifocals. Um, well, the patients don't like it because they, then they lose their, their reading glasses. And obviously, no talk would be complete without uh, saying that we can't forget osteoporosis and bone protection. So post-fall, if we want to prevent fractures in the future, then you need to address uh, bone protection. Um, and there have been multiple studies now showing that we tend, this is something we tend to miss. And, Part of it's the quirk of the Victorian system where the hospital likes to save money. So if they give you the stuff when you're discharged technically, then they can get it off the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. So we kind of leave it to the last moment before someone goes, before we start them on treatment. And that's why we miss a lot of patients. So just a few kind of, I guess, summary tips if you like. Um, previous falls are an indicator indicator of high risk of future falls. Um, we address risk factors such as vision, um, blood pressure, particularly hypotension. Um, refer to your local falls and balance clinic. Um, exercise can prevent future falls and don't forget bone protection. Thank you. Thank you, Quang. I know you've all been watching me with my glasses down my nose looking at the lights. <laughs> And wandering up a couple of stairs and I noticed that all of our speakers have sat in the front row <laughs> with uh, only a few little dark objects for them to trip over. Um, I did a whipple on a patient last week who was 82 who came in for their last consultation before their operation, uh, a politician, and presented me with their goals of care form before they'd even come into hospital, which was a first for me. Um, not that there's any problems having a whipple done. And, um, <laughs> So it brings us to our next talk from Jay Darvill, who's one of our intensivists here at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and also a senior lecturer in critical care education at the University of Melbourne, who's going to talk to us now about improving communication and goals of care. Thank you. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, Kelly, for the, the invitation. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit, uh, I suppose, nebulous, this topic, but um, what I'm hoping to do is to give you a little bit of a concept about uh, how we can perhaps best communicate with our uh, elderly trauma population, which of course is a high-risk population as we've heard already tonight. Uh, so, Ben, I'm sure this wasn't you in your pre-operative consultation with your Whipple's patient, um, although it is a terrible diagnosis, pancreatic cancer. But what we hope to do in our communication with high-risk patients is to avoid these situations, certainly avoid, avoid this situation. Uh, which you know, we, we, we see the really the, the perils of poor preoperative communication in the intensive care unit a lot. Um, so certainly uh, with trauma patients, but not at this hospital because we're fantastic at it. It is a modern issue, though. This is on the on your right of left of screen. This is the first anaesthetic that was ever given. Uh, we love this as anaesthetists. This is the Ether Dome, and for those that know the story, you know, young patient having a tumour removed from the neck, very short, either for the first time. Um, it was about all that could happen in those days. But you know, this is the modern workstation that that I use. Uh, the Royal Melbourne Hospital, you know, we can do fantastically complicated things to patients these days, um, which has en enabled in the trauma population a real suite of interventions. Uh, and the challenge for us is to really target who can best benefit from things without prolonging uh, really an inevitable process, and that can be hard. This is an American paper that 
I guess best illustrates for me the, uh, the perils of intervention towards the end of life. This is two million deceased patients throughout the United States from Medicare records, so it's, it's really quite robust data, uh, looking at the elderly cohort, so patients over the age of 65. Um, and the, the statistics are quite stark. So a third of all of these deceased elderly patients had surgery in the year before death, of whom a quarter of all of the operations were in the week before death. Um, they went further to derive, and I won't belabor it, this end of, surgical, end of life surgical intensity score, basically looking at the ratio of surgeries to deaths within each region. Uh, and they found a direct correlation with, um, with access to beds, raising the, the rather sinister concept of, of perhaps a fee-for-service uh, implication. So this is, this is really important, I think, for us in the Australian healthcare system as we move uh, by slow degrees more towards the, the US model. Um, the take-home messages from this Lancet paper were that a quarter of all surgery in the US happens in the last week of life. Uh, and 25% of all Medicare beneficiaries in the US have surgery in the last three months of their life. So th this is uh, really important. It's important because, as we've heard from Rose at the very start, the, the ageing population has huge implications for healthcare uh, in much of the Western world. In the US, the proportion of patients aged over 90 is going to quadruple by 2050. And similar trends are going to be seen in our country. Uh, over eight, patients over the age of 85 years are going to triple by 2040. So there's this, if you want to call it the great tsunami, although the geriatricians I don't think like that term, uh, but it's, it's coming. The UK have been um, very much on the forefront of, of looking at implications for elderly patients with surgery for a number of years. And in fact, their, their biannual uh, National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcomes in 2010 looked at this. So an audit of uh, 1,000 cases or more of patients, elder, very elderly patients, dying within 30 days of surgery. And they audited each case. Huge undertaking. So I'd commend you to read it if, you, if you've not seen it. It's really quite stark. Um, it begins with the phrase, this report makes depressing reading. Um, and the assessors went through and categorised uh, through using quite robust um, markers about the quality of care received. And it was really only about a third of patients that received good care of these elderly deceased surgical patients. This is just one example. Um, it's a uh, pretty sad tale. So, and, and one that you know, I've, I've seen variants on this theme, certainly, uh, through my, my practice. Um, so an elderly man, strangulated femoral hernia with disseminated metastatic malignancy. Uh, very appropriately, it seems that the patient declined surgery and, and palliative care was op opted for. However, after a day, the patient deteriorated with respect to his conscious state, um, and it was made note of in the report his ability to consent was reduced. Uh, and so he proceeded to theatre with the idea of of reducing this hernia or operating on this hernia just under local anaesthetic. Uh, widespread ischemic bowel was discovered. The patient um, was ultimately uh, underwent palliative care and died. And the comment from the assessors here was that perhaps one of the aspects clouding the judgment of the clinicians involved was that proceeding just under local um, made it perhaps more ethically um, robust or defensible. Uh, but the concept of the patient's original wishes hadn't been entertained enough. And this is really the paradigm shift, I think, in higher risk interventions that, um, that is happening. Um, this shift away from perhaps a more paternalistic model to, uh, if you want to use the buzzword, more of a shared decision-making process. And I'll talk about this in the next couple of slides. I think there's a number of reasons why Poor decisions get made in, uh, in you know, modern tertiary, quaternary um, healthcare. And, and in a large part, I think it's because we don't do a, a, as good a job as we could at explaining high risk procedures to patients and families. Um, this comes about as a result of a, a lot of things. Time pressure, I think, is, is one of the biggest things. Um, there's also biases that we all bring to our practice. Uh, this concept of optimism bias, which is where we, perhaps as clinicians, and certainly uh, patients and families, are optimistic about uh, the way things might go. We, we always hope for the best. Um, projection bias is related. So this is the concept that our future selves might share values, desires, goals that our current selves do. So I might not feel too much about the concept of a protracted intensive care unit stay, tracheostomized, mechanically ventilated, 
but my future self in that situation may have a very different concept of what that's like. I've mentioned the, the issue of fee-for-service. That applies less so in a, in a public tertiary setting. One of the big areas that I think is increasing in, in, uh, in its, its problematic nature is this concept of clinical momentum, though. This idea of sunk costs or, uh, if you like, spiralling or cascade of interventions. This is the definition of clinical momentum. It's pretty wordy, but uh, this nice review paper in um, Annals last year, a couple of years ago, describes uh, a case, and I think it's probably best, best explained through this real case that they talk about. This is a patient that would be very familiar to any of us that are working in, in the intensive care unit or on, on general medical wards. So uh, a multi-comorbid woman uh, who develops pneumonia and respiratory failure as the acute precipitant to come to the intensive care unit. So the plan initially is for full resuscitation, but uh, the lady is very explicit. She does not want to be kept alive on machines. However, um, the inevitable physiological deterioration happens. She's intubated, develops shock, commences vasopressors. That leads to multi-organ failure with renal failure. She commences on renal replacement therapy by day five. By day eight, she's got unresolving pneumonia with sputum plugging, undergoes bronchoscopy, she bleeds, she gets a blood transfusion. By day 11, it becomes apparent she's not going to wean from mechanical ventilation. And so the, the discussion about a tracheostomy is entertained. There's some quotes in this paper from the husband, very erudite. He says, she, she always told me she would not want to be kept alive dependent on machines. But we've come this far. We've gone through so much already. The concept of stopping now, we don't want to do. And viewing this procedure, the tracheostomy in isolation, becomes problematic. If viewed in isolation, each of these previous small interventions seems to have stabilised her situation and kept her going. And really it boils down to this nebulous concept of what is a long time left on machines? And the husband is not sure of this. This is the, the rather busy graph that they, they've put in this paper. I've put some axes on it, time and, and decision confounders, I've called them. And this is what makes it hard with higher risk patients, particularly higher risk elderly patients, who already come to us with a, a large number of medical conditions, who then undergo a large number of additional interventions. And this clouds the original picture and makes it harder as time goes on to decide what is indeed in the patient's best interests and in the patient's wishes. Uh, I'll gloss over these next two slides. They're not specific um, to, the, to the trauma population. This is a cohort of, of cancer patients. And all this illustrates is in a uh, retrospective analysis, looking at patients with whom good end of life care discussions uh, were done before embarking on treatment for, for their advanced cancer. And those that had had uh, a good discussion about these preferences underwent less intensive care unit stay, mechanical ventilation, uh, CPR, indeed less end of life chemotherapy and were much less likely to, to die in an intensive care unit where really no one, no one of us should aim to die, I don't think. But interestingly in this study, again specific to cancer patients, was there was a, a, a really interesting correlation between the cost of death and the rated quality of the patient's death. Now this was death rated by, quality of death rated by not only the caregivers, so that's the nurses, doctors, allied health staff caring for the patient, but their loved ones, in particular spouses. And they were asked to rate the quality of death from the worst possible to the best possible. Uh, so we see this direct relationship, which I think we all appreciate, between cost of death and poor quality of death. So that brings us to what I've sort of probably facetiously called here the old model, or I, I guess the status quo for many years, which is the decision to intervene, to, to conduct a procedure, to offer perhaps a high level intervention to a patient, which has primarily been conducted between a clinician or at least one one uh, specialty and the patient. Occasionally other clinicians with expertise will be born to bear on, on that decision and a decision is made to proceed or not. And this, I, I suppose, older model is, is beset by, by issues. The primary clinician deciding or making, making the, uh, the process to theatre or intervention um, possible might not know the patient well. That's certainly an issue in what can be a fragmented care model in, in public hospital settings, but especially so in an emergency setting where we don't know our patients before they come in the door. We don't know their values uh, unless we inquire about them. And we might be biased towards an intervention because it's what we do. Uh, 
Um, and as we've talked about, patients and families may carry bias, biases. So the new model, or the, the, I suppose the more uh, nuanced paradigm that, that you'll hear more and more about, is this shared decision-making concept. And this, this is really regarding the patient and the clinical team as a multidisciplinary team involving a large number of other clinicians. And that, in the surgical context, might involve anaesthetists, palliative care physicians, if we deem that a patient might be towards the end of their life, intensive care specialists, allied health staff, and so on. And, and this is a major shift, and it requires a shift in everyone's undertaking, and indeed a shift, a shift in health, servicing, re, health service resourcing. It takes time, it's expensive, and it requires devolving accountability and uh, responsibility to a team of people. This is an example of, of where it's been done very well. So this is in Omaha. Uh, this was a pre-post intervention study of almost 10,000 patients. And all they did was bring in a, a frailty screening process. They used a, the, the Johns Hopkins uh, clinical, clinical frailty scale, which is a good multidisciplinary tool. And patients that were deemed frail went to this multidisciplinary review board, which comprised those, those specialties. And they saw a sustained reduction out to one year particularly among frail patients where the mortality went from 12% down to 4%. And these are patients that all went on to have their operations. It was a bundle care intervention. Uh, as the authors say, it was a bit hard to tease out exactly what it was that changed, but it was probably a lot of different things. Modulation of the, the particular operation, perhaps uh, better post-operative care, failure to rescue was less, very good geriatric assistance in the pre- and post-operative phase. Um, so this multidisciplinary model certainly can help in the elective surgical setting. One of the big shifts, and I think this is becoming more and more common, is also in the way that we talk to patients. And this is uh, perhaps the crux of, of what uh, this 15 minute talk is meant to be about, which is how we can modulate the way we talk about interventions and procedures to higher risk patients. This is the best case, worst case model. This comes out of Wisconsin, um, and it's a really nice, uh, very easy to learn process where we change the way that we talk to patients about risks and benefits. It takes about two hours to train up, um, specifically it's focused on surgeons in the past, through simulated patient discussions, and the, it, it, it um, swings on this best case, worst case graphic, which I'll show you. Now, it's a bit busy, you might not be able to see it up the back, but uh, this talks about how we can phrase an intervention. So rather than talk about, and I'll go through some differences in, in discussions and how they change when these surgeons were trained, but rather than talk about risks and mortality and morbidity, we more describe outcomes. And we do this with the very best possible case that the patient may expect, the worst case that they might uh, have eventuate, and also, perhaps the most important part, the most likely spot that we think as the clinician, which might be wrong, there's a continuum at play, the most likely outcome that we think should a patient embark on a certain course of action. And this shifts the focus of discussion to outcomes rather than pure risks. And what this group of researchers did is they sat in on surgeon-patient interactions. Uh, this was in the elective surgical context. And they, uh, in a qualitative research project, looked at how the language changed. So prior to the intervention, training up uh, a group of surgeons, the conversations m surrounded more action and intervention. We must bypass that, widen it up, open it up. After the intervention, there was much more focus on, on choice. So the non-operative intervention was presented more as a choice. The diagram was used. In terms of the description of what the intervention looked like, so surgery and risk was described as probabilities, and death was a probability. Um, numbers were often quoted, which we know from, from good high-level research is not well understood by patients. After the intervention, the examples were much more hinging on outcomes. So what does this actually look like for you? This might involve you being in the intensive care unit for a couple of weeks, there might be a breathing tube, you might have difficulty coughing, breathing and so on. The relationship between surgeons and patients prior to the intervention was was very much one of uh, patient as the ultimate decision maker, um, information provided by the, by the surgeon, but the patient left to make the decision. Afterwards, the concept was much more as a team-based approach. I'm, I'm trying to relate to what your choices are, but also, I think, to help guide you. And in terms of making the ultimate decision, prior to the intervention, uh, there was a decision that needed to be made by the patient, um, and that was fairly concrete. Afterwards, 
the surgical teams probe the understanding of the decision. So if we do do the surgery, is that something you'd be okay with, that outcome? I wonder if you could tell us how you think about that outcome. So it's really a, a little subtle shift in language, but it led to a very uh, marked difference in how patients went about making decisions for their surgery. So, look, I think it's a bit hard to um, pin down one cause for difficult decisions and, and perhaps what I've called their poor decisions uh, in, in interventions for elderly high-risk patients. Um, but I think there's a, a large number of things that are born to bear. Um, I think that uh, there's a large amount of work that we can do to improve our discussions. In the trauma population, it's challenging because of time pressure and the, the challenge of making uh, speedy decisions uh, before pneumonia supervenes on fractured ribs, before uh, anemia becomes profound with uh, a bleeding injury can be, can be challenging. But um, having a concept of the scale of intervention at the end of life is very important. I'll finish with um, the, these couple of slides, which I think sort of illustrates the issue of intervening at the end of life. So 70% of Australians would like to die at home. Okay. Uh, where do patients in Australia die? So 50% die in acute hospitals, 37% die in, in residential care placement, 7% die in emergency departments, which I found quite a surprising figure, actually. It's almost one in 10, leaving only 7% of patients to die at home. So one tenth of those that would actually like to die in, their, uh, in the surroundings of their um, home environment. So we've got a lot to do, I think. Um, and I think trauma services in particular, like we've got at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, um, do a very good job of trying to bring those multidisciplinary teams together to get the best possible outcomes for the patients. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Our next speaker is Peter Lang, who is uh, one of our geriatricians here and a general physician as well, um, and a delirium researcher, and uh, currently the head of the acute medical unit at the Royal Melbourne Hospital since 2013. And you're going to explain to us delirium. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here, and uh, it's in interesting circumstances to return to trauma and orthogeriatrics. My first job here uh, around 15 years ago was actually as the first orthogeriatrics registrar here um, under the leadership of my esteemed senior colleague who will be speaking next. Uh, and it's there that I really fostered a strong interest in delirium because you would see those patients who fell into that cascade so astutely pointed out by my colleague um, who would cycle through that deterioration, drowsiness, aspiration, pneumonia, further deterioration, malnutrition and death mediated by delirium and you often see those patients just deteriorate and die of delirium and there's nothing to do about it and there certainly wasn't at that stage and that's what really led me to become interested. Um, at that stage I was only relatively fresh out of medical school and uh, what I had learnt about delirium um, was, well there were a number of things, but some of those implicit uh, instruction had been that it was a benign condition that was self-limited and it provided you treated the underlying illness uh, the, it would resolve uh, and it doesn't cause permanent impairment and it's now become clear that all of those things I learned were wrong uh, and I'll go on to explain why and the topic of this. Um, but first I wanted to give a bit of some information about some new ideas about pathogenesis. It is a mysterious condition. I always found it difficult to understand how all these uh, bizarre precipitants, corticosteroids, anticholinergic, surgery, anaesthetics, and yet also sepsis or a change in environment could produce this syndrome with so many predisposing factors um, like dementia, previous stroke, baseline medications, sensory impairment. How can you actually link all these together? Uh, there's been some theories of this, some relating around neurotransmitters, inflammatory or oxidative stress, or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis mediating stress impacts on cognition. Uh, but I'll give you one of the most promising new theories, which I think helps to unite uh, a lot of our understanding around delirium. And that's the idea that many of the higher functions of the human brain arise from distributed networks. And the, the interaction of those networks can be roughly summarised uh, on, on a single spectrum, which is probably inaccurate, but this is still very much in its infancy, um, as connectivity. Uh, the diagram here is, uh, is a, a colour-coded network uh, networks of axons and demonstrating some of the structural connectivity in the human brain. Uh, 
um, running, I guess, on those uh, uh, is functional connectivity. And you can see with high channel EEG the interactions between these various areas in various different states and uh, with various network activity. The idea of delirium, I think, and the most promising uh, theory underlying its pathogenesis is when these networks break, when they are dysfunctional, uh, you will develop problems of those functions which are mediated by those networks. So you'll see deficits in cognition, you'll see deficits in perception, you'll see deficits uh, in attention uh, and perhaps even deficits in arousal as you have global dysfunction. Not necessarily in one area, not mediated by a particular focal region or necessarily even a, a particular neurotransmitter system, but representing dysfunction of all of these areas. Once these networks are uh, knocked off course, they take some time to recover. Uh, and if you look at that structural connectivity diagram, as insults deteriorate the level of structural connectivity and predispose towards delirium, they will also predispose towards a persisting delirium, where the original insult has arrived, disturbed function, and yet it takes some time to resurrect that, um, if ever. There's uh, a number of useful lines of evidence um, which support this. I'm showing, uh, so you can demonstrate that, uh, of course, patients with deterioration in that structural connectivity uh, are far more likely to, to develop a delirium and persisting impairment afterwards. Um, you can also use even just baseline EEG, standard clinical EEG, to see that the, uh, the standard report coming back as encephalopathy consistent with, uh, sorry, background slowing consistent with encephalopathy. And that represents that functional connectivity, a global measure of what's going on in the brain, um, deteriorating and functioning poorly. Uh, the theory is quite useful and unites many of those other theories and, uh, and gives a hook to understand how many of these things can interact and how the vulnerable patient um, with a lower level of stimulus can develop this and has some promise in treatment options. Uh, what I also didn't learn in medical school was essentially anything about delirium motor subtypes. We understand these quite a bit better and some of their implications. Uh, so the hyperactive motor subtype occurs in about a third of patients, uh, mixed type in about a third. But the hypoactive, which we now understand to be the most morbid, the most undiagnosed, and unfortunately the most common in the elderly, um, is, uh, is it represents about a third. And occasionally you can see patients who actually have a normal motor state and other manifestations of, of delirium as the predominant feature of these. There is nothing in etiology of delirium that separates these. I cannot look at a patient with a delirium and say, you have a hypoactive delirium, you are more likely to have anticholinergic toxicity. Um, you have a hyperactive delirium, you're more likely to have sepsis as a cause, with of course the sole exception of alcohol and sedative withdrawals, which are going to be hyperactive. The manifestations really depend on the individual and their vulnerabilities. Uh, we're, we're aware that hypoactive delirium is much more common in older patients, and that will come of some relevance when I start to discuss post-traumatic amnesia. Uh, the prognosis is poor. It's certainly not benign as, benign as I learnt in medical school. So independent, match controls, independent of the underlying cause, delirium triples mortality. It persists for many months beyond the initial stimulus uh, and in fact uh, an ongoing debate is how do you tell the difference between a persisting delirium uh, and permanent cognitive impairment and that's, a, that's actually a challenge. It accelerates the progression of Alzheimer's disease but even absent significant neuropathology it in and of itself can cause persisting cognitive impairment. And keeping with that relationship, the severity of the delirium is associated with the likelihood of subsequent cognitive impairment developing. Uh, so to draw to treatment, uh, and this is still a disappointing section. So I think there's a general appreciation that uh, delirium is best managed with uh, multifactorial interventions. But the evidence for these is actually all in prevention. Um, so to prevent delirium, we want to avoid precipitating factors for delirium. And these are mostly the things that we do to patients um, that we can avoid doing. So making them dehydrated, malnourished, um, putting them in a low stimulus environment without uh, capacity in a, in a high stress environment, and usually low, stress, low stimulus environments without a lot of cognitive stimulation are in fact high stress environments. Reducing their ability to interact by reducing their uh, sensory stimuli. Uh, keeping them stuck down in bed, now that might be maybe restraints uh, with four-point shackles, 
But I put it to you that a patient with an IDC uh, attached to the bedside with oxygen tubing, with an IV line running fluids, is almost as restrained as if you had them in, in at least two-point shackles. They have a dim diminished ability to mobilise, to undertake the normal activities which support their brain function. Those are, avoiding those things are effective in the prevention of de delirium developing in hospital. But unfortunately, compared to standard care, even doing all those things in a, in a particularly rigorous fashion doesn't actually ameliorate de delirium that is developed. So you can't, as far as we know, modify the natural history of de delirium once it has developed. Exercise and cognitive stimulation are certainly part of these preventative measures but we have not yet established that those two particular interventions in isolation uh, are effective in treatment or indeed effective alone in, uh, in the prevention of delirium. So I'm going to go on to talk about post-traumatic amnesia because this is one of the areas where as geriatricians uh, we do tend to clash in terms of trauma services. Evidence for management of post-traumatic amnesia in a low stimulus environment comes from relatively small, and I can certainly appreciate how difficult it would be to, to do a blinded trial of these. Um, the outcomes are short term, so we're not looking at long term outcomes in mortality in, in long term um, cognition. So the kind of multifactorial interventions that we've assessed uh, in the setting of delirium really haven't been trialled for post-traumatic amnesia. So I guess we're in this situation where I don't know if those multifactorial interventions applied to PTA improve things or in fact um, cause things to deteriorate. And I also really don't know if there is perhaps a subset of patients with delirium, perhaps that younger subset who are more likely to be hyperactive um, are actually going to benefit from a low stimulus environment. We simply don't know, we don't have the evidence. Um, what does concern me about management of PTA, and particularly in terms of the crossover, it's not unreasonable to say, well, well what's the difference? Um, so this is one of the commonly used PTA scales, probably uh, familiar to many of you, it's the Westmead post-traumatic amnesia scale. And from a neuropsychological point of view, looking at this in terms of the constructs which it's examining, um, we don't have particularly good aspects of, uh, of attention there. And attention is one of those core features of delirium and many of those disorders of network connectivity, um, which are very important. We've got some memory questions there, but they're repeated day to day to day, so you've got practice effects. In terms of a, a neuropsychological test, it, it has a lot of flaws. It is well validated in the post-trauma setting. And, a, and correlates with outcomes and does demonstrate when you can uh, withdraw some interventions. But it has a, some deficits and I'm really not happy in, in using this to try and monitor the progress of delirious patients, if there is any difference. So this, on the other hand, is the delirium observation and screening scale, which I actually saw uh, one of my colleagues put up earlier, which I was very impressed with. So this spans the wide spectrum of manifestations of delirium. So this is a rating scale that can be done once per shift by nursing staff at the end of the shift. Uh, we know it takes about 20 seconds to do. They'll tick off the manifestations that they noted uh, during their shift. So about the first seven uh, are aspects relating to the level um, of arousal or cognition. Um, subsequently getting on to some specific cognitive questions and it's really under only the last four which are addressing agitation. Uh, there's a question there about hallucinations and delusions. So it really spans the wide variety of manifestations and uh, shows that delirium is really is not just or solely a disorder of cognition and attention but it's, uh, it's a disorder which spans pleiotropic uh, effects and manifestations in that patient. Um, so I think this is much more suitable for following the progress of a patient who is likely to have a delirium. We use this clinically to follow improvement and we use this clinically to see when things have deteriorated and might draw suspicion that a complication has developed. And this is probably one of the real values, given that I've told you that we can't make delirium get better any faster, um, we can certainly see things go wrong. We can see patients on that geriatric cascade develop an aspiration event, a pneumonia, sepsis line related events, you can see them decondition, you can see adverse effects of medications manifest in this. So this monitoring is particularly important. 
Um, a little chastened by my colleague who mentioned that uh, he likes to put up his own research just to show that he's doing stuff, and uh, here's some of my own. Um, so delirium prevalence at RMH, this was prior to the introduction of systematic screening, and was, certainly this work was one of the ones which prompted us. So overall we saw 12.5 prevalence, so about a 600 bed hospital, so, so we're looking at uh, perhaps 80 to 90 patients at this very moment with delirium just up above us. Uh, it rising to over 20% in the over 65 year olds, not unsurprisingly. Uh, and at that time, a quarter of our cases were undiagnosed. Um, we had some unit specific results. So trauma unit on a point prevalence uh, survey at that time, actually overall looks not too bad, 7%, that's not too bad. But my colleagues do tell me that can be up to 60 patients at times. So that's a lot of patients. And there were some of those patients uh, who uh, were being labeled as PTA and in this study, um, everybody who was perhaps undiagnosed, I came around and saw them uh, and reviewed the case and I thought many of these qualified for a diagnosis of delirium and that in fact was the more likely cause um, of their current um, issues with cognition or confusion. This is important and we should consider the baseline vulnerability. So those younger patients who have a significant head injury and a confused post uh, they are on that lower left-hand corner with a low vulnerability. Um, they need a really significant insult to precipitate a significant disturbance in cognition. On the other hand, many of the patients we've been talking about today with frailty uh, or that predisposition towards it uh, might have high vulnerability and uh, so they're sort of extending from the upper left down to the lower right. So they need a less noxious insult to provoke that delirium. In those patients, a deterioration in cognition uh, is out of the natural history of the improvement, hopefully, in their head injury. We need to watch vigilantly for problems there as they may uh, be the only sign of a complication which is developed, which, which may be one of those things which results in that mortality rather than their original injury, which I think uh, is following with the theme of what my colleagues have been talking about tonight. So my and others' views is in fact there's not much separating delirium and PTA in the individual. I think they're probably both manifestations of the same kind of connectivity problems with a different cause. And yet, if I could say that for delirium, really we draw a very arbitrary distinction uh, between delirium as having causes outside the brain as compared to other disorders, very similar, very similar manifestations which happen to arise from within the brain. For example, the um, encephalitides, um, infectious and otherwise, look very similar. It can be hard to distinguish. There's not much evidence of benefit of pharmacological management in terms of improving long-term outcomes in either condition. There's not much evidence to guide the, uh, the patient-specific intervention with non-pharmacological management. Certainly nothing that I would say improves, is likely to improve that outcome in that patient as opposed to maybe making them more manageable on the ward. Maybe some phenotypes of PTA would benefit more from a delirium style management and maybe the reverse. Maybe a very hyperactive delirium would benefit from more of a PTA style management uh, in reverse with a low stimulus environment. I'm really not sure of that. In the older cohort, I do know that delirium is go just going to be the more common cause, more concerning, and I believe it should be the priority and assessment of management of the patient. And even if they're not just different manifestations of the same syndrome, Lots of patients have two things wrong with them, so I think we should consider both. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. That was great. Just before I introduce Eric, I, just, uh, I was an orthopaedics uh, resident in the early 90s, Eric, and most of my job was trying to medically manage patients with no help from anyone else. And so... Uh, <laughs> A real plug is, I mean, the, the Orthopaedics Geriatrics Association at the Royal Melbourne Hospital in the early 2000s was just phenomenal in terms of, I think, in terms of managing those patients. And then expanding that out to trauma and geriatrics later on was also a great innovation. And, and in fact, now many surgical units are desperate to have similar relationships um, because of this burden of problem. And so, you know, be great in the future if we can expand on this uh, across all of the surgical specialties and not necessarily just orthopaedics and trauma. So, Eric, I'd like to introduce you. A geriatrician here at the Royal Melbourne Hospital was a registrar when I was a resident and, um, and a, an, an ortho geriatrician here since 2005. But you're going to talk to us about outcomes. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks, Ben. Oops. Got one back one. Um, yes, when I originally was invited to become the trauma geriatrician here, they said, don't worry, there won't be many patients. This is a young person's game. How wrong were they? <laughs> uh, that was, but anyway, getting on. This is what we used to do when we used to look at trauma. Um, big, nasty accidents, usually young people driving too fast, that kind of stuff. And if we actually look at risk-taking behaviours, um, motorbike accidents, motor crossing, hang gliding, uh, parkouring, <laughs> bungee jumping. Compare this with what we see in our elderly group. So in the elderly group, we actually have what I estimate to be somewhere between a quarter and a third of all the people on the trauma list are about 65 and over. So you're thinking, are they doing the same things? It's more like this. So they're falling off their ladders, and this is probably the biggest group of elderly men. For women, it's falling from a standing height, and that's what we've been alluding to today. And the other major group, I think, are the motor car, or the motor vehicle accidents. So it's probably the big three groups that we see. So falling from a standing height for women, falling from um, a height for men, and in the motor vehicle accidents, it's usually the man driving and losing consciousness with the poor wife trying to steer him away from the, um, the cafe that he's driving straight towards, and then veering off at the last minute. Okay, and that's the kind of thing we see. Um, in the physiology of the elderly is different to the youngsters because they don't respond as quite as well. They can't reach out with their hands. They're more likely to face plant and have nasal fractures and to have head injuries. And I'm, I'm sorry to bring up this slide again, but it's just to remind me to mention the word frailty because this is probably the most important connection between the elderly and their low impact traumas and why they get so injured. And so if we actually have a look at frailty status and mortality, you can see that in the older group, so I just see, you have robust, pre-frail and frail, and the bottom group are the frail patients, and they're mo most likely to have um, an earlier mortality. And this is a slide we've seen before, and basically it looks at one stressor, um, when you're actually physically robust, which is the upper line, or when you're physically frail, and that person's just below the, the frailty threshold. And so that stressor is it enough in the frail patient to actually create a catastrophic effect, whereas in the youngster or in the less frail patient, they actually do much, much better. And I just pressed the wrong button. Okay. Um, when it comes down to talking about long-term outcomes, I work in the acute setting at Royal Melbourne, so I kind of thought, what do I know about the long-term outcomes? I don't see these patients one year, two years later. And so I was very, very grateful for the um, article that was uh, handed around, which is Ben Beckenor from the Department of Epidemiology at Monash and the Alfred. And um, this is a very, very good paper looking at a 10-year study of trauma in Melbourne, the, uh, the two major trauma centres and also the paediatric trauma centres at the children's. And the important point to bring up at the bottom was um, when we talk about major trauma, we're talking about not the actual traumatic event, but the outcome. Um, we're talking about people dying, and they may die because they, they fall four storeys off a building, but it may be that they do fall from a standing height with significant injuries and, and root fractures. And uh, you know, you're looking at two different, dramatically different people. Injury severity score um, can be high in the elderly. ICU admission and um, urgent surgery, these are the, the markers towards major trauma. And so the elderly people don't need as much trauma to be in the major trauma group. And this is a slide to actually look at the years and the change in the demographics. The blue lines, the paediatrics, the, um, the orange and the red lines are the, um, the normal or the adults, and the geriatricians are in the upper group. They're the, uh, sorry, the geriatric patients, Jerry. <laughs> The, the upper group, the, the purple group, so everyone over 65. And you can actually see it reflects the thing that we observe, which is it started off at about a quarter, and around the year um, 2016, it was almost a third. So it's that kind of amount of people who are actually greater than 65 in the trauma group, and it's made my job very busy. And just having a look at the types of traumas, um, again, the bottom blue line is the high fallers. The purple line above it is the, uh, the transport accidents. And then the low fallers, the people who fall from the standing height. That's the group that's actually increasing in our community. So that's the group that we really need to target the most. And they're the group that are the most frail and vulnerable. And this is looking at age 
and long-term um, outcome. The bottom line is the, the people who die in hospital. Um, the next line, the blue line, is the 12-month mortality. And the top line is the, uh, the reduction in um, independence. So people who become less independent and less functionally independent. So as you can see, from about 60, 65, 70, there's a kind of an exponential rise in this line. And so this uh, reflects probably the priority again, what's happening there. Okay, and this is probably the most depressing slide of the whole um, presentation, and I'm sorry to present this. This looks at 65 to 74s, and then the middle group 74s to 80, sorry, 75 to 84s, and then over 85s. And this is something called the Glasgow Outcomes Scale, uh, which looks at uh, the function or the long-term outcome. And the blue bottom bar is death, so that's a, a GOSS score of one. And the top one is um, good outcome, uh, functional independence. And so you can see that as we go in the next, in the increasing cohorts from the 65s to the 75s to the 85s, we're actually doubling our death rate um, with all the, the uh, trauma that we have. Okay, so I've got some Royal Melbourne data too. And when I was actually saying before, we, if you have a look at the two bottom lines, one is the, um, the, the red line is the under 65s, the blue line is the over 65s. And this looks like all cause mortality. And it's about the same in both groups. But you have to remember that the, the geriatric patients are one third to a quarter the same as the group. So their mortality rate is three to four times higher. That's what that means. So how do we improve things in the future? Maintain physical and mental function. Back in the 30s and 40s, the best way to actually get fit and stay fit was to go out dancing. And that's what people used to do every Saturday and Sunday nights. And then in the 50s, something bad happened. Television. And everyone sat at home and watched TV, and no one did anything. They just sat there as couch potatoes for the next 20 to 30 years. And then we realised the troubles that that created, and then we created important breakthroughs like line dancing. <laughs> and then following that, we actually had some scientific things like Tai Chi. And then people decided it was time to get fit again. And then lately what's been happening is we all go to the gym six times a week so we pay for our gym membership and we have a personal trainer and that's all very good and other people actually have uh, uh, exercise physiologists that was a word that i had today um, so that's the latest thing so there are moves to actually improve function other things we can do medication review and this is what we love as geriatricians we love to de-prescribe we look at charts and say nah 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 you don't need your antidepressant. You haven't been depressed for 30 years. No, you don't need fruzamide for your swollen ankles. We can do better. So all of those things that people don't need, we stop. And that's helpful. Bone health has already been alluded to. People who fall fracture because their bones are more brittle. So if we can actually make bones less brittle, they're less likely to have injuries associated with that. Vaccinations are important in the young and the old. Falls clinics. Um, I work in a falls clinic, so I have to say that that's probably one of the important things. And falls clinics, as Quan said, they do work. Nutrition is important. I have to mention it for um, one of my colleagues, Andrea. So um, that's her major focus. And if you think of more energy going in, um, that actually increases uh, protein and uh, physical energy coming out. And finally, more geriatricians. <laughs> And that's where I'll stop. And because I'm the last speaker, I can put up the question sign um, because that's when we do ask questions as well. Good. Thank you, Eric. Can we get uh, five speakers from the front out here? And also Kelly, I think you're going to come and join them as well. And then I'm going to get a couple of people to run up and down the aisles with um, microphones as well. We might need one more seat. Um, I, I'm going to start asking a few questions. Um, as you've already heard before, we've sometimes got 60 inpatients for uh, trauma at the moment, uh, compared to when we had 25 uh, inpatients in the past, which was much more manageable, and a larger portion of, of what we're seeing are these patients. How do you think we need to be, do we need to be separating them, managing them in a different way, in a different environment? Um, they're very different to our younger patients in terms of how we're managing them. What are your ideas about how we might take this forward? Not Rose. 
There's a couple of things that we can do to actually help the, the um, older patients in our community. We can actually give them a, a little bit of a kind of warmer atmosphere. Surgical wards can be a cold, scary places, and so if you can actually have good staff who actually uh, communicate and engage with patients well, that's always a very, very good start. And um, also uh, medical staff can be helpful there and, you know, good engaging, encouraging people. You know, we always hear about the crusty old surgeon, but I don't know many of those. I think most surgeons are very, very warm and engaging people and, and do a very, very good job and they love their patients, uh, just like us geriatricians. Um, but I think the other thing is probably something Peter alluded to is kind of a, an orientating place where, you know, you can actually have be aware of the date, aware of the time, aware of what's happening around you, um, and staff that actually help you kind of from the point of view of confusion management. And I find that the best wards for demented patients are dementia wards because the staff are non-confrontational, they actually are soothing, calming people. And I think hospitals in general have to try and be a little bit less confrontational and, um, and more kind of assuring and helping in that regard. Anyone else? Am I allowed to speak? You are. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just from the, uh, the trauma patient's perspective, you know, when we have these patients who present with multiple injuries, I think at the moment our system is fragmented. Right. So, we, as, I, as I mentioned in my talk, we're very good at identifying the injuries and saying, yes, this is broken, we need to fix this. But we don't deal with what led to, to them falling, like the, the, some of the conditions that we've heard about that, about the being over-medicated, for instance. And then we're not very good at, once we've fixed the traumatic problems, we're not very good at managing and stabilizing their pre-existing conditions. I think in an ideal world, if we had the resources, we would have a dedicated admitting unit where any patient, purely based on their age, if they've sustained trauma after their initial assessment and resuscitation in the emergency department, they would be admitted to this unit. It, and it would be a multidisciplinary approach to their management. So they, we would have the, the trauma surgeons, orthopedics, neurosurgery, based on their injuries, whoever needs to see them will see them, but as an absolute criteria, the, the geriatricians and the physicians would also come and see these patients, and we would cap the length of stay in this unit. We would say by day three, the injuries need to be identified, a plan needs to be made for them, and a decision with all the members needs to be made about where does this patient need to go from here which unit, which environment is best suited for this patient. So if they have ongoing traumatic injuries that need intervention, they may be better suited under the trauma service. But if they have injuries that are going to be conservatively managed and we find that it's the medical problems that need to be addressed, then they need to go to our physician colleagues. But we need the resources for it. Are there any questions from the audience at the moment? Yes. Hello. I was just wondering if there's any thought to um, managing the, cog the cognitive decline in some of these patients um, with the delirium and post-traumatic amnesia, uh, getting them home as soon as possible into that familiar environment and incorporating hospital in the home or um, gym at home to finish off that rehab side of things in a familiar environment. Is that something that's considered? Um, so I can't speak specifically from the trauma point of view. Um, certainly from the delirium point of view, we have evidence that that is safe and effective in selected patients um, and should only be encouraged. Uh, and as, as I think you've heard me say, that I don't think there's a great deal really separating post-traumatic amnesia from delirium other than the patient that it actually occurs in. So uh, potentially uh, patients who are suffering from PTA who are appropriate, who are safe, other issues are resolved, who can go into a, a safe environment at home. I don't know. We should, we should try it and find out, as we have done in delirium and found that it's, it's safe and effective. It doesn't seem to improve the cognition, but it does appear to vastly improve the agitation, and that's a, certainly a good thing in and of itself. One, one of the questions I've got on the phone here is, um, why, why do we 
what I was just, are gonna, you just add a really slight, yeah. 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 I mean, I work with the uh, subacute at home service and some of the challenges are, number one, if someone's got delirium, there's not always someone could provide that 24-hour support. The other is somebody with delirium cognitively don't 100% recover and we need that plan at the end of it. And there are sometimes barriers, but I think definitely it would be something good to work with. Uh, so this question was quite simple. Why do we choose 65 years of age to be getting geriatricians intervening and should we not be choosing frailty as a better indicator of that? <laughs> I think that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, I've been pushing it for a long, long time to make it 75 plus. Um, a lot of 60... <laughs> A lot of 65-year-old men drive Harleys, and you know so the number of accidents. Not very well. But not yes, exactly, not very well. And you know when I see someone in my age, in my demographic, saying, "Oh, I've come off my Harley again," and I think, oh, "Why am I seeing you?" And you know, as soon as he goes home, he'll be back on his Harley, and he's you know he's more concerned about his bike than himself. Having said that, you know if we could actually find a frailty, a good frailty index, so we're targeting in on frailty rather than age, I think that would be the, the most wonderful thing. And so I'm hoping that you have got the answer to that. Yeah. I was just going to say on the converse of that. So I went from working in the geriatric rehabilitation unit in Kew, which had mostly people from private hospitals, to the Northern Hospital. And my patients were still geriatric, but 10 years younger. And so the rate at which we accumulate age-related physiological changes varies hugely depending on what's happened through life. And I certainly see people who are younger than Eric, maybe, yeah, um, but who <laughs> have, you know, multimorbidity, they've got cognitive issues. Conversely, you see people who are in their 90s and still doing really well. So absolutely, we need to move away from this age issue, but it's, logistically, it's also easy to have a number as a hard cutoff. Yeah. I mean, with, with drug addiction and alcohol, we're seeing 40-year-old patients who, who look like they're in their 80s, and, uh, and we're not necessarily using all that we have at our fingertips to, to manage them. Question. Tell. Thank you, that was fantastic. And I guess a number of people in the audience from the big hospital over the other side of the Yarra. Um, thank you very much. Clinical momentum was mentioned, certainly a strong element in this theme. Victorian State Trauma System, do we need to relook at the triage criteria? based on which the patients are then transferred to the appropriate centre. Those of us who've worked across different hospitals, the simple four with a couple of ribs who ends up in the minor section of ED, we now know clearly can have significant sequelae. Do we need to look at it right from the start? What will that potentially mean for our work capacity issues in emergency? And uh, the acronym FFSH, four from standing height, is now something that we use because it's just so damn common. Thank you. I, I think that, um, you know, the concept of clinical momentum, I think it's probably familiar to everyone that's, that's dealt with trauma patients and uh, sees exactly as you say, the, the innocuous injury in the higher risk elderly, perhaps frail patient that then fairly quickly develops into something a lot more major. I think what um, certainly the Royal Melbourne Trauma Service does a fantastic job of is very early intervention. So, uh, and I'm sure that's, that's true uh, south of the river as well, where a whole multidisciplinary team is brought to bear very early on, even quite innocuous problems, to get the best possible management early for the patient. The challenge, I think, with clinical momentum is then to recognise when patients have deviated from that, uh, if you like, pathway. Um, and we are at the one week, two week mark, multi-organ failure, now mechanically ventilated, in a very different state, uh, and imparting a, a big burden of, of care on, on a patient. Um, and that can be very challenging to pull back from. Whether that, whether we can ameliorate that with very early intervention, like you say, I, I think probably, yeah. Yep. Was part of what you were asking whether we should be looking at spreading the pain? Correct. Yeah, because um, there's been a few questions from paramedics as well through on while we've been working here about what role they may play in these patients. Do they all need to come to the two adult trauma centres? I mean, we had and not so long ago that every patient with aspirin who knocked their head was coming to the major trauma centres, which has now been changed to just every other antiplatelet therapy under the sun. Um, <laughs> but maybe, so what should we be looking at there? Did you want to? 
Um, I just think that the Victorian State Trauma System guidelines are not very clear on age. The age guidelines in them are over 55, other than the isolated head injury patients. So I think we do need some work around that and where these patients are best managed. Um, and then, yeah, are we able to actually have some of them sent elsewhere where they can be well looked after, where they don't necessarily meet a major trauma service? But I think the guidelines don't actually currently help with this problem very well. So just in terms of, I think the paramedics do a wonderful job with the patients that they do bring to us. I think in the trauma setting, as I think Jay mentioned, you know, you, we don't have the benefit of time. So you have a patient in front of you that you, you have to um, immediately make the decision as to whether you're going to stop or subject them to sometimes multiple significant interventions. And I don't know how practical, practical this actually is, but if the paramedics have the benef benefit of having the next of kin um, at, the, at the event to clarify the patient's wishes so that when they arrive, they can tell us, look, this patient's wishes are this. We can certainly take that into consideration rather than trying to make a decision on the spot because in the trauma setting, it's very difficult. And I've, at times, have given the patients the benefit of the doubt, saying, well, he was driving his car, so, you know, will proceed and, and uh, some of them have survived but they have, there, there are many who don't so I think that we, that would be useful. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Well, I can't it's see a you question, it's a comment Ben. <laughs> From the other um, trauma centre, <laughs> we dedicate a paediatric trauma centre. Why are we not looking at a dedicated geriatric trauma centre, mm. looking at the numbers that we've got and this is something that we need to do and lobby our government and um, not just in Victoria, right across Australia and the rest of the world. What do people think of a dedicated um, geriatric trauma centre? I think that would be a great idea. I think certainly from a nursing perspective and even an allied health perspective on the acute surgical wards here or the trauma ward where we look after the patients, I definitely agree with Eric that once we've sorted out their trauma issues and we know what the plan is, um, we do really lack the skills and knowledgeability on the wards to look after the patients you know in a nice comforting way and we don't have the right environment for them either there's limited natural light very poor space for them to mobilize in it's just i think you know they need a purpose-built major trauma center for the elderly st vincent <laughs> I just want to say I work at St. Vincent's too. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that, it does ring some alarm bells. A couple, about 10 years ago, the government was talking about a heart hospital where every cardiac case went and every chest pain went. And that to me sounded rather silly. Um, I'm a big one for actually believing that we can share the love and we actually learn from people around us. And if we've got people of different disciplines all working together, you could actually cross uh, disseminate knowledge and practice. And so to actually have a dedicated geriatric hospital would be great for the, the geriatric patients. But I think the patients who are going into geriatrics or in the younger hospitals uh, wouldn't be getting the same kind of approach, be it nurturing or maybe even paternalistic. I'm not even sure what the word is. But um, I, I just think it, I quite like working in a hospital where I can actually see young patients as well. Um, and, you know, the 50-year-olds who do have cognitive issues, who are the, the drug addicts and things like that. So, again, it's a, a matter of how you kind of separate them, and I'm not sure how we do that. So that's just my, my cautionary no. tale. But you also need the acute surgical services still in our elderly patients. I mean, well, you still true. need acute neurosurgery in these patients. And yep. so it's not like it's a hospital where you're still not going to have exactly the same services required. Well, it's a question of the setting. What happens? Do you actually have a travelling team that goes from young trauma to old trauma? Yeah. I don't know. I think in 30 years, every hospital will be a geriatric uh, <laughs> hospital, so I don't think you have to worry about that. Uh, I think it's... Um, look, I think the best... Uh, I guess the best principle of care... So going back a couple of questions is we've learned a lot from orthogeriatrics with fractured hips, and it's just the same principle of care, which is... You know, um, uh, get in early, get the procedures done really early. So, that, you know, unlike young people, old people can't wait. So one of the mistakes we often make with interventions is we kind of sit on people to see what, what happens. And really, with an old person, 
your, your, your decision early is very binary. You can do something or not, and you better do it quick if you can do it. And then after that, we can pick up the pieces. And, and often we find it, it's very manageable after. Um, I'm a great believer in minimizing kind of things sticking out of people, so catheters and things which are sometimes very unnecessary. And also um, up and out, so early mobilization, we let the physios getting early. And one of the problems is not that we don't have the wards and things to do it. We don't have the manpower to do it. So, you know, the physios, we don't have enough physios to get people up and out. Um, we don't have enough physicians to see all the patients. And, and I think that's part of the problem that the, the health system needs to recognize that it is a team sport. Um, and, and they recognize that in cancer, which, you know, you get like an 85 year old with dementia and they have about 14 people looking after them. And yet this is far more common and, the, and we don't use expensive drugs. Uh, in fact, we like to stop drugs. Uh, so, you know, it's just the principle of management, which is you need a multidisciplinary team, early intervention, um, use local blocks, um, and get people up and moving quickly. I mean, that's just very simple management strategies. Kate, did you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for some great talks, guys. My question relates to the narrative we use with goals of care. Um, not so much to treat or not to treat and then to palliate in sort of the immediate short term, but the goals of care for an elderly patient, irrespective of whether it's trauma or another acute episode, is often very different to an adult and certainly different to a paediatric population. So my question is, should we be looking at the narrative we use? And I really did quite like that, that talk with regards to how, with that training, how do we actually consent a patient and explain the differences and the likely outcomes and putting it within a context and I think about the patient with the C2 fracture. Well, yeah, we can go down a pathway to give best, best outcome and, and longevity, but we, if that patient really just wants to be able to get home and, and all the rest of it, we might tolerate a shorter lifespan, but there's a better quality of life because it depends on the values of that patient. So I guess my question is, should we be looking at that narrative a bit more? And is there a role for palliative care in that? Not so much to set everyone off on a syringe driver, but where treatment is purely based on symptoms and, and um, rather than longevity and curing something, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot of it's in the, uh, the salesman's pitch. Uh, if you actually pitch for treatment and upper and better, um, and I think there's something to be said for that. I'm probably more uh, a nihilistic person who would actually say, well, look, these are the pros, the, these are the, pros, these are the cons. Uh, you know, my expectation of the best possible outcome is that. And would your mother, father, would your wife or husband, would that be what they want? And it's partly what we were talking about before. Um, yeah, uh, I've had some terrible patients in the past who actually haven't had operations and died horrible deaths on the basis that if they got in quickly, had their, their limb fixed, you know, they may or may not have survived, but it would have been a much better outcome. And it, it's been horrible. So I suppose I do become a bit paternalistic from my own experience about what I do, and I'm, I'm sure we are like this. I suppose a geriatric uh, approach is slightly different to an ICU approach, and I don't know how we marry that because I, I must admit I don't go down to the ICU as much as I should to see our geriatric patients there, and perhaps we should start doing that. And we try and stay out of the geriatric wards as well. <laughs> um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the analogy, uh, Quang, that you made with fractured neck femur, I, I think it applies very nicely to trauma where, uh, exactly as you say, it can be a terrible um, nursing burden, you know, m managing a patient with unfixed fractures, uh, even if we take a non-operative approach in the wider context, it can be a very hard thing to do. So having a, a defined surgical plan that's decided on early and pursued with vigour, but then continually reassessing every day uh, whether the patient is progressing you know, in a fashion that, that they should be, and if not, then reassessing goals of care. So they're not fixed goals of care, and we, we frequently adjust as we go along in this hospital. I do think palliative care has a role. We haven't really spoken about it tonight. Um, and it, it, you know, palliative care comes with this whole uh, kind of loaded, I suppose, um, context of syringe drivers and, and death and, you know, that, that's all it has to offer. It's quite the opposite. I, I really love that New England Journal of Medicine article about advanced lung cancer and 
um, aggressive treatment versus palliative care, and the palliative care randomised group, randomised control trial, lived longer. Um, and uh, re read that if you haven't read it, it's fantastic. I think palliative care have a lot to offer and we get them involved in the intensive care unit wherever we can um, and certainly we get them involved in trauma patients uh, because they often have quite complex end of life needs, particularly pain. Pain management is really challenging in the, in the dying trauma patient. Um, so yeah, it's a really difficult kind of area to work in when it is time critical trying to make these decisions as well. And I guess another point as well, we always talk about informed consent and we put this onus of decision making often onto the patient's families, but they don't often understand really the decisions they're making, they don't understand the implications. And it's very different having conversations with sons or daughters of older adults where they've already experienced a parent going through intensive care, have very different opinions on what they want for the surviving parent. And, you know, as we're not obliged to offer futile medical treatments in Victoria, and so I think as well we have a duty as clinicians to, you know, as an example, we don't offer CPR in people with advanced dementia because we know it doesn't work. So it comes to the shared decision making, part of that comes with offering things that are likely to give benefit and not putting too much responsibility on people and leaving them in situations where they experience distress. In, in the elective setting for cancer work, there's a lot of evidence about comorbidities and operations and predictors of what's going to happen to you. And one of the things that I found in patients that they worry about the most now is being institutionalised after a major operation. The problem in our trauma patients is that we actually don't yet, I think, have enough data to tell us what's going on. And I think we may find, in fact, that our outcomes are extremely poor after major trauma. So that information would be really important for us to gather so that we can actually have an informed conversation with our patients. But often we're giving them hope uh, about their outcomes when, in fact, it may be extremely poor. I just uh, want to just ask one question as we're closing up. When I was in the New York with the CEOs looking at EMRs a few years ago, I noticed that a number of the major hospitals in New York had geriatric emergency departments. So completely separate from the main emergency department. Should we be looking at this? Was <laughs> that the AMU? I think I, I think I get this because I'm the closest to the uh, emergency department, um, <laughs> physically and maybe otherwise. Um, uh, so I think uh, you know, that sort of came out of some of the models for paediatric uh, emergency departments and I think there's, there's certainly some parallels uh, in that uh, elderly patients both physiologically and for all the reasons we've talked about tonight don't, perhaps don't perform the same way but I, I guess my answer would probably be much the same as in discussing whether we should have geriatric trauma centres um, which is everywhere is, is already a geriatric emergency department with the exception of possibly that place a little bit further up the road. I mean, if you walk through there and apart from the, the fast track stream and even there, they are very elderly patients, they have comorbidities, they return uh, repeatedly. They have even the ones who perhaps aren't chronologically aged have psychosocial comorbidities that mean they return, that mean they manage their health conditions poorly uh, and they have the same kind of complicating factors. The whole health system, needs to change, the bulk of what we are dealing with has these problems of multimorbidity, the psychosocial predictors uh, of disease and of vulnerability to complications. Um, so I think you know, for that reason, unless you're a paediatric hospital, everywhere is a geriatric hospital and everybody's a geriatrician. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up there guys because it's now 8.30. Thank you very much to our panel. Can I thank you all for coming and especially also to the people that are online uh, uh, who have been watching. I reckon we've had some really great speakers tonight. Um, I've learnt a lot, um, still got a long way to go. Uh, but I'm really grateful to our speakers as well. I'd also like to thank the trauma registry team who put a lot of the data together tonight. Thank you, Kelly. But as always, I just want to thank number one, Kelly. <laughs> He's done all the work and a lot of the ideas and all of the preparation and really made the rest of our lives a lot easier. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you.